History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 490th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly in Florida. Yay! She's <laughs> back in our studio, our glorious back studio. Back in the closet. Yes. <laughs> We're both back in the closet. <laughs> On this episode, Kelly, we are going over to France. Oui, oui. And we are going to. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so bad. And we are going to talk about a place that is on my bucket list. If I was ever to make it over to Europe, I've always wanted to see the Palace of Versailles. Looking forward to sharing this with the listeners. Yeah, there's some interesting stories connected to it. A lot of great history. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the spectacular crew. I hope I'm saying this right, Claudie, who has two eyes at the end of her name. Sonia, Rose, Jackie, with a Q U I E at the end. And Jessica, who has two I's instead of two S's. Thank you for joining our Facebook group. And now, this moment, Noddity. There are many strange and captivating animals on this planet. One of which I recently discovered is the great Potu bird. They are found in the Neotropics and look more like a flying black-eyed Muppet child than an actual bird. There are seven species of Potu, and the majority have eyes that look similar to owl eyes, being that they are quite large for the size of their head and tend to have yellow or orange irises. However, the great Potu, or Nyctobius grandis, have very dark brown irises, giving them the distinctive appearance of a black-eyed child or a demon-possessed bird. They are fuel for nightmares. All potus are nocturnal insectivores with a beak so thin it looks more like a claw coming out of the center of its head. That is, until they open up their giant maw. Their mouths open from ear to ear, giving them the appearance of being all mouth. The only thing one can compare to this is perhaps what Barbara, played by Gina Davis, does to her head in Beetlejuice, thus displaying how she plans to scare off the new homeowners. If the mental picture I'm painting for you isn't enough, then Google their call and imagine hearing that in the pitch dark. Shivers. They are also able to camouflage extremely well. So basically, you would just be left wondering what monstrous creature is preparing to eat you. I love all creatures, and given the opportunity, would certainly interact with this bizarre black-eyed bird. But as you can tell from my descriptions, the great Potu certainly is odd. Grab your slippers, hot chocolate, flashlight, and maybe even that baseball bat. And now, this month in history. In the month of June, on the 6th, in 1978... California voted in Proposition 13 by an overwhelming margin. This was an amendment to California's constitution that signified the taxpayers' collective response to dramatic increases in property taxes and a growing state revenue surplus. The amendment reverted the most recent assessments to the 1975 market value levels. This limited the property tax rate to 1% plus the rate needed to fund local voter-approved bonded indebtedness. It also limited future property tax increases to a maximum of 2% per year. Under Proposition 13, California properties would be reassessed to current market value only when there was a change in ownership or if the property had undergone new construction. 
This proposition led to the possibilities of significant variances in property taxes, with the assessed values being based solely on the dates the properties were purchased. Longtime owners could only be raised the 2% limit from year to year, while a neighboring property of similar land and build that was recently purchased could be significantly higher to approximate market levels. The entire estate that is part of the Palace of Versailles covers 1,978 acres. The grounds are immaculate and amazing, and the palace itself defies words. What started as a simple hunting lodge became the seat of power in France and is today a museum featuring the most exquisite artwork and craftsmanship of any palace in the world. The palace has also been the setting for a strange time travel story and for ghost stories. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the Palace of Versailles. You know, Kelly, we always talk about synchronicity when it comes to the podcast. Yes. Our last episode, we talked about Pickfair. And what did it start off as? A hunting lodge. Yeah. So this one, (laughs) same thing. The earliest mention of Versailles is in a document dating to 1038. The lord of the village here was Hugo de Versailles, and that is whom it's named for. And the word Versailles means turn the soil. This was a small village, but it did manage to flourish because it was on a road leading from Paris to Normandy, and so it benefited from the trade along the route. The plague and Hundred Years' War devastated Versailles. King Louis XIII would make visits to the area to hunt, and he grew a real fondness for the feudal village. In 1624, he ordered that a small hunting lodge should be built. This was a cozy chateau made from red brick and was designed by Philibert Le Roy. The western side of the chateau had an ornamental garden with a fountain and pathways. By 1632, the king was enlarging the chateau, adding exterior towers to the four corners and a dry moat. And most of the time here in France, instead of using the term palace, they use chateau. But when I think of a chateau, I kind of think of a a quaint little place. Yeah, same. But I think it's our, our American minds. It definitely is because the bonus cast that also has dropped this week... While I was doing the Palace of Versailles, I found all these other chateaus, at least four other ones that are haunted. So those are make up the bonus cast. And so I was like, yeah, definitely chateau is their term for these big castle like structures. King Louis XIV would succeed Louis XIII and his getting into this world wasn't easy. His parents had been married for 23 years, and his mother had suffered four stillbirths before she was able to carry him to full term and birth. People called this a miracle, and his name reflected that as it meant God-given. On a side note, Louis XIII was said to have fathered an illegitimate son who was imprisoned during the rule of Louis XIV and is known most famously as the Man in the Mask. Obviously illegitimate, but still claimed to the throne, and he would have been older, so I think this was his way of hiding him so that nobody knew there was another heir. King Louis XIV was known as the Sun King, and he took the throne in 1643 after his father succumbed to tuberculosis. He had a love for Versailles, just as his father did. He made the palace his primary residence and brought the French court and government there as well in 1682. The foundations of the Grand Palace would be started during his reign, but the project would be abandoned when he died in 1715. The palace would sit neglected for several years, but King Louis XV would come in 1722, and he decided to complete his great-grandfather's work. Wait a minute. Great-grandfather's work? How is that possible? This is the next heir. What happened here is that Louis XIV's son and grandson both died before he did, so his successor became his great-grandson. I thought that was crazy when I was reading this and researching it. I'm like, how in the world is this guy doing his great-grandfather's work. Right. Louis XIV had designed the palace to have large public spaces inside, and Louis XV didn't care for that. 
so he designed smaller, more private rooms. He also completed the Royal Opera House. Although Louis XV clearly enjoyed the Palace of Versailles, he never officially lived there. He was nearly killed in 1757 when a man named Robert Francois Damiens stabbed him between the ribs. Thankfully, it was really cold and the king was layered up, which is what I would have been doing. So see, this is a safety thing now, Kelly. It's not just about being warm. (laughs) So the knife wasn't able to penetrate deeply. Damien's was tortured, drawn, and quartered. Don't try to kill the king. Perhaps some people might see this as a fitting punishment for trying to kill the king, but the parliament didn't care for it, and neither did much of the French public. Historians point to this moment as being the start of the downfall for the French monarchy. Louis XV was succeeded by Louis XVI. Louis XVI would be the last king of France. He was born in 1754, and he became king in 1774. A few years before that, in 1770, he married Marie Antoinette of Austria. He was 15 and she was 14. Louis was ill-prepared to be king. He was a second son and never meant to be king, but his older brother died when he was only nine years old. Both his parents had died from TB by 1767. King Louis had some good ideas at the beginning of his reign. He wanted to abolish serfdom, which didn't please the French nobility. Louis also embraced non-Catholics, removing the land tax and labor tax, and he abolished the death penalty for deserters. But he also had some bad ideas. He deregulated the grain market, and before long, bread prices were way up, and there was food scarcity. And although we Americans appreciated his support of our fight for independence, he drove France into debt and financial crisis helping the colonists. Riots began in the streets as the French people became more displeased with the monarchy represented by Marie and Louis. And the public saw Antoinette as an unwelcome foreigner. They disliked the alliance with Austria. King Louis was born at the Palace of Versailles, and that is where he lived. He and Marie had four children and adopted six children. Marie was a fashion icon who loved to wear her hair big, and she loved jewelry and her wealth. Her annual clothing budget, Kelly was $3.6 million in today's dollars. Oh, my word. Annually. (laughs) I know some Hollywooders that are that way, too. She had trouble with learning as a child, and some called her simple-minded. But part of who she was came from being raised to be an aristocrat, and she was continuously waited on hand and foot. I'm not trying to make excuses for Marie Antoinette, but she was very much coddled. Although history has credited her with saying that the French people could eat cake when she heard that there was a bread shortage, she never made that statement. Marie also got embroiled in a scandal over a very expensive stolen diamond necklace that she actually had nothing to do with, but the French people still blamed her for it. The Petit Trianon on the palace estate became her personal estate, and she embellished it greatly with artwork and furnishings. Now, while she seems like an out-of-touch rich woman, Marie was generous. She had houses built on the estate for the poor to live in, and she took part in charitable endeavors. But all that good couldn't heal the rift that was growing between the monarchy and the French people. By 1789, the public had had enough. A meeting of the estates general was convened to discuss raising tax money. The representatives of the people of France were known as the Third Estate. Whenever there was a vote, the first estate, which was the clergy, and the second estate, which were the nobility, usually would join forces to vote against the third estate. The third estate was done with this business, and they proceeded with a new general assembly to write a new constitution. King Louis allowed the assembly to go forward, but he also gathered his troops. This worried the people, and eventually an angry crowd stormed the Bastille Fortress in July of 1789. This was the beginning of the French Revolution. And that's why when people are pushing back against their government, they liken it to storming the Bastille, because that's what they did in France. Women marched to the Palace of Versailles in October of 1789, and they demanded that the starving people be given bread. Thousands soon joined them, and the palace distributed bread, but it soon ran out. By the next morning, the protesters had broken into the palace. This is why it's always important that you make sure that you keep the people fed. That's why they always say bread and circuses to distract people, because as long as you keep their bellies full, usually they'll be okay, pacified. So again, here we see it not working. When you run out of that food, the people are like, we're done. 
the Marquis de Lafayette rescued the queen and escorted the royals back to Paris. A former lover of the queen's, the Swedish Count von Versen, helped the royal couple escape the palace where they were imprisoned in Paris. The couple dressed as peasants to throw off the guards and boarded a carriage headed to the French border. Marie and Louis made horrible peasants, and they drew too much attention to themselves, and soon a man recognized Louis from his face on the paper money of France. Good reason not to put your face on the money, because then the people all know what you look like. And apparently, while they're going along, they're just, you know, hey, everybody, how you doing? They're handing out stuff, oh, giving away word. stuff. <laughs> I think Marie, underneath all of her peasantry, had some of her jewelry and stuff on. So, I mean, it was like, you're supposed to lay low and get out secretly. Don't draw attention to yourself. And so they really screwed themselves doing that. The couple were arrested and taken back to Paris. Legend claims that Marie's hair turned to white from her fear and shock. King Louis was guillotined in January of 1793, and nine months later, Marie was also guillotined. Many people soaked their sleeves in her blood. The monarchy of France was finished. The Palace of Versailles, fortunately, was left undamaged. And what happened to Marie when she was locked up is they were having a hard time getting people to agree to put her to death. They got one of her children to testify that she was abusive, and that's what finally did her in. Many of the royal possessions were taken to museums, and much of the other stuff was auctioned off. Napoleon became emperor of France in the early 1800s, and he decided not to live at the palace because he didn't want to give an image of the monarchy. He lived at the Trianon, the palace property was converted into a museum and sometimes served other roles for the national government. It played host to the signing of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. The palace has been expanded and renovated through the years, usually getting around 8 million visitors a year. There are over 2,300 rooms in the palace, and the property includes the great stables, vast gardens, the royal chapel, and the estate of Trianon. In 1979, the palace was named a World Heritage Site. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. One of the most impressive areas of the palace is the Hall of Mirrors. This is the most famous room in the palace. There had once been a large terrace here that opened onto the garden that was between the king's apartments and the queen's apartments. That terrace had been designed by Louis Leva, and it was certainly not something to add to his resume because people thought it looked awkward and it was susceptible to bad weather. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> it was demolished and replaced with the hall starting in 1678. The hall would take six years to complete and was designed by Jules Hardwin Massach in the Broke style. <laughs> Hopefully I said his last name right. <laughs> Has that little <laughs> <laughs> at the end. <laughs> We're not making fun. It's just we're terrible at pronunciation. I mean, I think everybody already knows that. So that's why when people give us grief about our pronunciations, I'm like, duh. It's not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> we try. We go to Google and pronunciation guides. But there you go. The hall has 17 windows on the wall facing the park. And on the opposite wall are 17 mirrors. These mirrors were made from 350 individual mirror surfaces and added a great effect of mirroring the park into the interior of the palace. These mirrors were a sign of the wealth of the monarchy as producing mirrors was expensive. These mirrors have a dark legend connected to them. The French didn't know how to make mirrors, so they hired Venetian artists to create the mirrors. The Venetian government didn't want the secrets of the mirror-making techniques to be known, so they had the artisans assassinated. Oh my word! Now, we don't think this bloody tale is true as the order for the mirrors went to a French factory and this broke the monopoly Venice had on mirror making. Ah, OK, then. <laughs> so that's what I managed to find in the research. Now, in between all the lines here, what could have happened, they definitely got these Venetian artisans to emigrate over to France. So I don't know if somewhere in there they taught the guy who opened the French factory. I'm not even going to attempt his name. If they, you know, showed him how to do things and then we went from there or if somehow the French figured it out on their own and now they're competing with Venice. I don't know what all happened there, but they do sometimes call this the Hall of Blood. The hall is lit by massive chandeliers and there's lots of gold coloring everywhere. Originally, 3000 candles would be used to light the hall. 
The vaulted ceiling featured 30 paintings by Le Brun that pay tribute to France's economic and political successes. There are Rouge de Ronce pilasters topped with capitals of gilded bronze. So we all know that Rouge means red, of course. So this is red of Ronce. What this is is a red reef limestone from the town of Ronce, which is in Belgium. Oh, it's very cool. Beautiful. Kind of looks like a red marble. Le Brun designed these as well, incorporating the national emblems of a fleur-de-lis topped by a royal sun between two Gallic roosters. Originally, there had been solid silver furniture in here that was melted down and coined by Louis XIV to finance the War of the League of Augsburg. Silver furniture? That just doesn't sound very comfortable. <laughs> no, I don't Shiny, know maybe. if they had cushions <laughs> on it or not, but yeah. And you would hate it because it would be cold. Oh, yeah. At least it's silver. I, I just, I don't like gold at all. That's why when I was describing <laughs> it, it had a lot of gold everywhere. I was just like, ugh. The other original furnishings were lost during the French Revolution. The furniture in there today is from the 19th century. Sculptures in the room are marble and porphyry busts of eight Roman emperors, and then there are Greek and Roman deities that have been paid tribute to, which include Venus, Hermes, Bacchus, the Muses, and Diana. Louis XIV visited the hall every day, which makes sense since it was mainly a tribute to him. You can imagine he just walked in and goes, yes, there's a painting about what I did there, and there's another painting about what I did there, and another painting about what I did there. And he was called the Sun King, so you can imagine it got a little bit to his head. I would imagine. Court festivities were held in here like balls and weddings. This is where Louis XVI and Marie were married. The other jewel of the palace is the Royal Chapel, which has been under restoration for several years. This is said to be the spiritual legacy of Louis XIV, and this was his last major building project. It was announced in 1682, but work didn't start until 1699 and took 11 years to complete. The chapel stands taller than the palace at nearly 132 feet. So when you're walking up, you're going to see the chapel way above the palace. Goodness. Which, I guess, if you're thinking about it, you should put God above the king. Hardouin Mansah designed the chapel. The stonework facade is interrupted by large windows. There are Corinthian pilasters, and there are 30 statues made by 16 sculptors on the balustrade. The roof has decorative lead work that was once covered in gold leaf. The interior has frescoes on the ceiling, stained glass windows, and several freestanding columns. A large ornate organ, which was designed by, and I'm going to butcher this name, Clicquot, provided music. This was decorated with a relief of King David. The inside of this chapel is just amazing, and this organ, wow, and it still plays. There's a balcony with the royal gallery where the king and his family sat. The ladies of the court sat inside galleries. I could go play Baby Elephant Walk. I would love to hear that <laughs> in this big fancy chapel with you playing that on the organ. I would absolutely love it. Other highlights of the palace include the Gallery of Great Battles, which covers nearly the entire first floor of the South Wing. The gallery is decorated with marble and is lit by glass ceilings in the vault. There are 30 paintings that depict 15 centuries of French military successes and 80 busts of officers killed in battle. Bronze tables feature the names of princes and other officers who were wounded or killed. This is the largest room in the palace and was completed in 1837. There are several historic galleries to visit like the Empire Rooms, Coronation Room, Crusades Rooms, and the North and South Attics. And the King's State Apartment and the Countess Dubarry's apartments are not to be missed. The Countess was Louis XV's last mistress. The apartments are lavish and reached by the King's Staircase. They open up onto the marble and stag courtyards. Not only was it convenient to have the King's Staircase there, but they actually had a secret doorway that went between the two, too. I bet they had a secret knock, too. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> well, we're not just here for the fancy stuff at the Palace of Versailles. We're not. We got some ghost stories here. <gasps> I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> the most well-known paranormal story connected to the palace has been described as a time travel event. Now, Kelly, for you and I, a ghost encounter could just simply be a time-space slip. And so that could be what had happened here. Because we like to ask people what they think a ghost is. People ask us all the time. So when they break this down and call it a time travel event, I'm like, 
it could have been a ghostly encounter, too, because that might be what a ghostly encounter is. Charlotte Ann Moberly was the headmistress of St. Hugh's College for Women in Oxford. Her assistant had been a former student of the college named Eleanor Jordan. These two English ladies decided to take a trip to France, and they couldn't resist the opportunity to visit the Palace of Versailles. It was a hot summer day in August of 1901 when the ladies arrived at the palace. After touring the palace, they decided to walk over to Trianon. They got a bit turned around and asked a couple of men for directions. They were struck at the look of the men. They looked like they were dressed in costumes, green coats, they were kind of long, and three-cornered hats. They also were carrying spades. As the women continued along their route, they both started to feel a bit distressed, and they couldn't explain why. They ran into another man who was sitting near a Chinese kiosk, and he stared at the women in a menacing way. They kind of described him like he had a pocked-up face, so then people started thinking smallpox. Miss Moberly felt even more distressed after this. But then another man with curly hair and dark eyes came up to them and he spoke in a language that was hard to understand and he seemed to be telling them to continue along a path to the right. A bit down this way, the lady saw a woman who was wearing a period dress and white hat drawing a picture. Miss Moberly was very disconcerted at this point. The women returned to Paris and Miss Moberly asked Miss Jordan, Do you think the Petit Trianon is haunted? Without hesitation, Miss Jordan answered, Yes. They discussed everything they saw, compared notes, and decided that something strange had happened to them. The women had each noticed little things that seemed off, not just in regards to the people they met, but with their surroundings. There was no wind, and everything seemed flat about the landscape. They kind of described it like they'd walked into a painting. Interesting. A woman standing outside of a house with a jug seemed almost to be a wax figure. As Miss Moberly thought about the woman who was drawing, she became convinced that the woman had been Marie Antoinette. They returned to the location several times and tried to retrace their steps and never found a landscape or buildings that matched what they had seen during their first weird visit. The two women decided to risk ridicule and wrote of their experience in a book they published in 1911 under the title An Adventure, translated as Les Fantômes de Trianon in French. I like their title for the book better than An Adventure. That doesn't sound like much, but the other (laughs) one sounds like Ghosts at the Trianon. Yes. The book was actually very successful. And while many people believe that the women just made up the story, a discovery lends credence to their story. An old architectural plan of the Trianon was discovered, and it revealed that a Chinese kiosk had indeed existed in 1774. As did a bridge the women suggested they cross that was no longer on the property. Skeptics have debunked the story as a possible hallucination or embellished story. Each time the story was printed, it did seem to be more embellished. So, you know, kind of like how stories grow as you tell your fish tale or whatever. The game of telephone, perhaps? Yeah. Art historian and biographer Philippe Julian wrote in his 1965 biography about an aristocratic French poet named Robert de Montesquieu. He apparently lived near the palace grounds and he liked to host fancy dress parties in which his friends would wear costumes, particularly period costumes. Julian reasoned that the women simply stumbled upon one of his parties. Brian Dunning of Skeptoid wrote of the experience, It was only after much discussion, note sharing, and historical research that Moberly and Jordan came up with the time period as 1789 and assigned identities to a few of the characters they saw, including Marie Antoinette herself as the lady sketching on the lawn. Dunning figured since the ladies were lost that they had stumbled upon another property, and that was where the bridges and kiosks they had described were located. So what happened here, Kelly? Do you think these ladies really had some kind of a time slip? Did they make up a story? Or were they in the twilight zone? Possibly. (laughs) There is another account that claims some similar weird happenings. That account goes that Miss Jordan and Miss Moberly were not the only witnesses to the time slip phenomena at Versailles. An English family who lived for two years in an apartment overlooking the gardens observed similar happenings throughout their residence. And when they returned later for a visit, it became evident that they had never seen the modern early 20th century Versailles while they were living there. They also observed the painting lady while in the gardens. 
and she pulled her canvas away when the son of the family, himself an artist, tried to get a closer view. So maybe these were all ghosts that the women had seen, or maybe it was some kind of weird time slip, or maybe it was nothing supernatural at all. But that isn't the only paranormal thing that has happened at the palace. Former occupants may be here now in spirit form. The most infamous couple to live here, of course, were King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Lots of trauma is connected here. We have this couple being whisked away by an angry crowd, and they were ultimately beheaded, and then there was the French Revolution. Visitors and staff claim to feel cold spots and to see white mist by Marie Antoinette's bed in Petite de Trianon. Apparitions are seen in the Queen's apartment, and this is where Marie's spirit seems to spend most of her time. Marie's ghost does get around, too. She's also said to haunt the La Conciergerie, where she was held captive for five weeks until her beheading in 1792. This is Paris's oldest prison, and the Queen's sobs are said to still be heard to this day. King Louis XVI's apparition roams the halls of the palace. Some wonder if he's looking for his family. Orbs have been seen, cold spots have been felt, and other apparitions have been seen. One of the other ghosts is said to belong to Benjamin Franklin. I thought that was really weird when I read that. I was like, what? Yeah, as I was reading it, I'm like, that seems kind of random. I know he haunts a lot of places, but the palace? He had visited the royal couple in 1778, and perhaps he so enjoyed his stay that he likes to hang around in the afterlife. Former President Charles de Gaulle had used the northern wing of Grand Trianon as his offices during his presidency, and his spirit has been seen a few times. The Grand Trianon also hosts the spirit of Napoleon Bonaparte, who stayed there with his second wife on several occasions. Mari wrote, I visited Versailles in 2007, and I assure you that there are ghosts in that place. I felt really bad in Marie Antoinette's room. I felt cold. I had the feeling of extreme sadness, fear, and a lot of anger. Makes me wonder if she's an empath. I heard voices, sounds of metal banging, things breaking, and footsteps. And yet, I was alone on a stairway near the Queen's room. I dragged myself to one of the gardens where there was a fountain, and this garden was dead. The air was heavy. There were no animals like birds, butterflies, nothing, only this heavy silence. It is oppressive, and that experience scared me to death. I'll never be back at this place again. Wow. Everybody else who goes is like, wow, it was so amazing. So I guess if you're an empath, watch out. The Palace of Versailles was the setting for some important historical events, not just for France, but for the world. Did a bizarre time slip occur here? Are the spirits wandering around the property? Is the Palace of Versailles haunted? That is for you to decide. Have you ever wanted to see the palace? Well, sure. Let's just hop on a plane. <laughs> I was just wondering if it was one of your bucket lists, too. No, I would absolutely love it. I would actually want to see this before I would see the Eiffel Tower. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We'd love for you guys to see our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you'd like to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. Queen of the segues. Did you love that segue? <laughs> Monica wrote in The Crew, since it was talked about a little bit during the last episode, I'm curious what you all think. When someone you love has passed on and they show up in a vivid dream, what do you think that is? Is it just a dream? Or are they saying hello? I lost a dear friend, Dave, a couple of years ago. He showed up in my dreams the other night. In the dream, his dad was sitting on one side of me and Dave was on the other side. Dave's dad was literally crippled with grief. His arms had shriveled up and he was withering away. I asked if he could see Dave sitting there, and he said, no, my son is dead, and he started crying. Dave then looked at me and said, tell him it's all right. I'm just on the other side. That's all it is, just another side. I tend to have pretty vivid dreams, so I'm hesitant to say it was actually him visiting me, but it was just a calm and reassuring dream. What do you think, Kelly? I do believe that when we have very vivid dreams like that, that it is a form of visitation. I agree. I think it's an easy way for people to come back is in dreams. And I've also heard that you're more susceptible to the spirit world, like if you're on drugs, drinking alcohol or sleeping. And so when you hear that, it's like, well, then it would be easier to come to you in a dream, I would think. When I've heard people talk about these dreams where they feel like they've had a visitation, the one word they always use is vivid. So if you're having a very vivid dream, I would say you probably had a visitation. Yep. We got this email from Hannah. She said, I've been a longtime listener, but haven't written to the show until now. The synchronicity of episode 488 and current events sent a chill up my spine. That synchronicity gets everybody with us. Sure does. 
we certainly can't make up just how strange and synchronous our world is. During the This Month in History segment, you discuss the life of Arabella Bell Babb Mansfield and that she had attended Iowa Wesleyan University. This Wednesday, May 31st, was the last day of the university's operation and the final day of my employment there in the admissions office. In March, the Board of Trustees announced that due to financial strains, the university would be closing after 181 years of operation. Oh my goodness. Could not have been a simple decision. Bell's statue was one of my favorite parts of campus because our maintenance team dressed her up for campus events and because she was the first to greet students walking from their dorms to the academic buildings. I'm not sure what the future holds for the campus, but I hope that her statue is well cared for and she shared a picture of it. Oh, very cool. Yes, the picture she shared shows her looking like she's reading through a book and she's got a cape wrapped around her. Maybe it's the school colors. I would imagine. It's been so crazy lately. There's been so many synchronicities with the oddities that I've written and the histories. Yeah, and these are just random things that we do. But what are the chances that we write in one of the history segments about this woman in this college and it drops the same week that that's it, the college is closing? Yeah. P.S. I also love the episode on Co College. I graduated from there in 2018, and during my freshman year, the Student Activities Committee brought in a paranormal investigator to go into Voorhees Hall to try to speak with Helen. It was cool, but I'm not sure if he reached her through the spirit box or if it was just some other entity. The campus is old and has a lot of history, so who knows? I lived in that building my junior year and didn't have any paranormal experiences, but the main lobby after 9 p.m. always creeped me out a little. And I just had written back to her, what a bummer, Hannah, to not only have the university shutting down, but then she also lost her job on top of it. Thank you for sharing those stories with us. We want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode isn't brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome into the cemetery, Rose Morocco. And I hope I said your last name right. We're going to be putting you in a garden crypt, which means in three months, you're going to be getting your HGB mug. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. We really could not produce this show without our executive producers. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting. And join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us. Lord of the Village here was Hugo de Versace. Versace. Is he a snakes? I mean, it's like Versailles, but not quite spelled the same. King Louis XIII would make visits to the area to hunt, and he grew a real fondness for the feudal village. I can't say feudal village together. Louis XV was the seat seceded seceded succeeded yeah whatever (laughs) same thing right Eh. i don't know what all happened there but they do sometimes call this the hall of blood and that would be my blood if i was in the hall of mirrors because i just picture myself in a fun house running into stuff (laughs) (laughs) here's what kelly would do go (laughs) you think it's mirroring the park but it's actually oh is this a door i can go out and look at you know into the park (laughs) I mean, I did do that. You ran into a sliding glass like, door, didn't you? Yes, because you closed it as I was rushing to bring stuff in before the hurricane. <laughs> I, I bailed off that thing. That's I'm surprised right. I didn't go through it. My, I know. I, I can't believe you didn't break it either because you mean, really jacked yourself up. I sure did. I keep my chiropractor in business. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, 3,000 candles would be used to light the hall. Hot, 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 hot. 
<laughs> Feeling hot, hot, hot. <laughs> Kelly's like, I would just be this, dead. This is a trying candle to make my way through. Reflecting it. in the mirror, right? No. <laughs> Don't stick your finger at any candle, whether you think it's in a mirror or it's the real deal. 